Hi, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the third webinar of the series All About Our Products and Their Users, organized by the Community of Practice on Ontology of the CGAR Platform for Big Data in Agriculture. We will start uh, now with Damien Dulé, scientific programmer and ontology developer at the University of British Columbia, and he will give us a description of the food ontology. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I am an ontology developer at the Shao Public Health Bioinformatics Lab in Vancouver, British Columbia. We operate out of the University of British Columbia, but we're also um, embedded within the Center for Disease Control there. I'll talk about that in a moment. So just going to touch on a few things as we talk about food on. Um, I'd like to uh, argue that ontologies are a great platform for reserving, uh, for resolving term semantics, <clears throat> and they really provide a language for describing things and modeling processes, categorical and numeric variables. And so that's the low-hanging fruit that scientists can take advantage of. They connect many domains together in in informatics, um, human and animal health, anatomy, chemistry, agriculture. And uh, they do involve a curation community in an app ecosystem. So it's not just that um, the ontology can stand on its own. It is quite dependent on this uh, ecosystem. And they have quite a learning curve, but here goes. Our learning started um, within the context of public health. Uh, at the Center for Disease Control, epidemiologists are studying uh, foodborne outbreak, uh, disease outbreak all the time, infectious diseases. So um, about five years ago, they hired me to help with a project for software for sequencing um, foodborne pathogens. And a great example of this is the 2010 E. coli outbreak that uh, lasted two months. And as folks in Europe probably remember, uh, 4,000 plus ill affected 16 countries and the Trace back, trace forward and trace back led eventually to Egyptian uh, fenugreek seeds, um, probably one lot. So obviously it's super important to um, do um, investigations that are quickly concluded. And the weakness at the moment though is that the food uh, terminology in these investigations that should be shared cleanly and quickly between agencies is facing this barrier that there was there was no actual food vocabulary um, sitting there harmonized and normalized. So uh, this is exemplified by these uh, interview forms that EPIs use at the CDC Atlanta here. Um, when did the onset of symptoms of the disease happen? Where did they happen? Did you have to go to hospital? Uh, their their uh, their interview form for um, exactly what was eaten, how whether it was canned, salted, pickled, how it was heated, cooked, and what kind of food to product, of course. This level of detail is what EPIs are interested in. It uh, also turns out that food nutritionists are also interested in the same vocabulary, and the folks in industry uh, who are doing the food processing are also using a lot of these same things. In, the, in processes. So there's this uh, confluence of vocabulary need happening. Here's a Center for Disease Control form um, at our, in Vancouver, same kind of questions. And the WHO um, also has a, a form for global use. So that put us on the search for looking for a um, ontology <clears throat> uh, that would fulfill these needs and we uh, couldn't find a comprehensive food vocabulary in the ontology world. So we started looking at uh, the more traditional um, data formats that the lang uh, that a vocabulary might be in. And we ended up settling on Langual, which was a uh, uh, food indexing and description vocabulary designed for nutritionists and some other kinds of academic study. It was actually started in 1975 in America. Right now, it's um, hosted in um, by the Danish food informatics folks in, uh, in Europe. So this is a, a little slide that shows how 
uh, Lang uh, Fudan's uh, evolution from Languel. Languel started at the, as the factored food vocabulary in 1975 uh, in the US FDA. You can see uh, on their ancient uh, data systems that already back then they were uh, thinking of describing food by part of plant or animal, the degree of preparation, the preservation method, containers, cooking methods, uh, food source, plant or animal creature, codifying uh, all of those things in order to describe a food sample. Um, a few uh, other American agencies used food on, or it was actually, sorry, they used the factored food vocabulary. It eventually became known as Languel. It was picked up in Europe uh, around 1990. And um, the and it eventually made it to the web in the year 2000, where um, it's currently uh, hosted. So we wanted to take that uh, that Languel um, XML formatted vocabulary and translate it into the world of ontology. And we operate within um, the Oboe Foundry family of ontologies, over 50 ontologies that are aiming to be um, mutually compatible. And you've had um, presentations from folks like Chris Mongal and Pierre Boutigig um, and, um, uh, and a few others uh, already, so I won't go into that very much. But <clears throat> um, just to say that uh, we took those facets from Languel and created um, linkages and reused vocabulary. So part of plant or animal is now being fed from Uberon, the anatom animal anatomy, and the plant on anatomy ontology. Uh, the actual taxon uh, involved are coming in from NCBI taxon. The uh, food additives and vitamins and other chemical references are coming in from Kevi uh, for the most part now. <clears throat> and um, the various processes um, are being used to tie it all together. Uh, relations, sorry. Okay, so <clears throat> the um, uh, this bag of terms <clears throat> approach, shopping bag, uh, enables us to recreate in in uh, food on what was happening in Languel in terms of indexing foods. So this um, a product like organic mash carrot baby food jarred uh, can be described as um, food that's in a jar, that it's a carrot strained baby food, it has an organic label, um, a quality is semi-solid with smooth consistency. Uh, it's a food source organism is carrot plant, uh, which is a root of, uh, of a plant and so on. But what ontologies do on top of that bag of terms uh, the potential there is to model things uh, more um, concisely. So it's not just that the um, <clears throat> food product has a strange uh, um, descriptor. Uh, this is a quality of the food product. The consumer has consumer baby. Uh, the uh, output of this product, this product is an output of the sterilization by heating process. And the product has part, some part of plant or animal. So we're bringing in the relations as well. And that's what distinguishes um, ontology use from a number of other traditional vocabularies. Altogether, this enables us much more accurately to uh, describe the transformation of a food product from its origin um, organisms and in so doing, I think we can keep track of um, the transformations that are certainly of interest to nutritionalists and also to EPIs in the trace forward and trace back and to other, um, other stakeholders. The positioning of food on within Obo Foundry and entails that it's actually sitting and conforms to the basic formal ontology, an upper level ontology that seeks to describe the world, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but the um, punchline there is that the uh, BFO 
ontology has about 32 terms that are start in the most abstract philosophical realms of occurrence and continuance. And this uh, language isn't really that accessible to most people, uh, especially uh, with a, <clears throat> it requires some, some learning and, and reading, but we want to enable people to get down to the level that they're at um, working with the vocabulary without needing all of that upper level um, abstract uh, philosophy underpinning. So on the Food On website, we've provided a, um, a page that documents the structure, the location of more particular facets of the food ontology within this hierarchy. So you can jump straight to them. So underneath um, environment material, uh, food material starts off um, uh, one hierarchy with all of the food products organized by their uh, primary organism. There are under material entity, material things, um, other those other facets that we saw briefly, the food packing medium, the food supplement forms, container or wrapping, organism by taxonomy, um, the taxon and the parts, the anatomical parts. So just to touch on the more abstract philosophy um, that uh, is brought to the table, we have this material entity world of the um, of the plants and animals and the tin cans and all of the other uh, physical things and then there's a process transformation the food process uh, branch that allows transformation from these into uh, transformed material and from that um, there, there are qualities which can be observed and you can derive uh, information, datums, and statistics, and identifiers of things. So that's at the most abstract level I like to operate at. Um, and the job of the ontology is to provide the vocabulary, the syntactic structure for sentences that you can create that um, touch on all of those aspects. And the data layer, or instance layer, as the ontologists call it, <clears throat> Um, is, is, is your database of sentences that conform to the ontology. This particular way of organizing things involving processes between uh, things can be really helpful um, in giving you data structures that capture um, what's going on in a particular domain. So just as an example, this bean, uh, bean plant uh, example, we'll just skim through here, uh, bean plant, is of course the thing that um, all of our bean food products rely on. And beans, a particular whole little bean, is something that develops from a bean plant. Now that's a shorthand set of relations for um, getting you straight to the use, using the term bean in context of products and the plants they originate from. But there are um, other processes involved and um, intermediary things going here. So bean pods are actually where the beans come from and they develop from parts of bean plant. There are different kinds of pods, shell bean pods, dry bean pods, green bean pods, and um, they culminate in both whole, raw, and dried, uh, dried beans through these processes, drying process, harvesting process. And of course, the realm of bean food products uh, involve lots of different substances made from bean, including bean flour, sprouts, cooked beans, rehydrated cooked beans, and so on. So the, the food ontology is aiming to um, achieve this level of modeling in the different areas of food and using uh, processes to do so. And the process modeling doesn't just extend to food cons constituents, it can also um, get into the realm of nutritional analysis. So we begin with a, uh, a specimen of some kind, a process, which is a processed material, and apply an assay, a testing assay to it, in this case a nutrient assay, a testing assay. The output of that is a datum, and um, it uh, can be transformed um, into other kinds of data and statistics. So we're aiming to um, 
apply this level of modeling as well to the nutrition component of um, food. Just to give you uh, folks an idea of how these vocabularies um, connect together, uh, I've created a visualization tool called Ontotrek, which lets you uh, select a particular ontology. Um, we'll just take a quick peek at the agro ontology here. Agro brings in, of course, from so many, uh, as uh, Marie-Angelique Laporte uh, presented uh, in one of your previous presentations. And so this visualizer lets one uh, go and um, travel around an ontology such as Agro or Food On and see all of the different uh, terms and uh, search and you know, find uh, upper level and, uh, and more detailed terms. <clears throat> so. Um, just to give people a, a real sense of how this uh, universe of terminology can fit together to describe a domain of interest. Um, I will flip back to the slides and talk about other applications that Frudon is being used in, so in that ecosystem. Um, so we spent a bit of time uh, working on how to create a um, a standard for foodborne pathogen um, sample and a genomic uh, sequencing repository uh, metadata. And this is an ISO standard that's in the works uh, in draft mode, and it's 100% ontology driven. So uh, the work of this project was to uh, create web forms that are are ontology driven entirely in their vocabulary and the naming of their fields and that um, cover the facets of description that are important. So these um, pull down menus are all being driven directly by ontology and by food run. Uh, so that's one direction we see um, food on being used in. There uh, are other ontologies now that are interacting, uh, taking in food on plant and animal food source and product terms. The, uh, they've all cropped up um, recently, just as food on has. So in the last year, uh, food interactions with drugs ontology, a food biomarker ontology, and ont ontology for nutritional studies have all cropped up. And um, the disease, human disease ontology is now using uh, food on to reference uh, allergen, uh, food allergens. And uh, in more detail, the ONS uh, showing how it's drawing on a number of different ontologies, including food on to talk uh, about nutritional studies and their metadata. So future plans for food on involve um, some more work with the US Department of Agriculture. We're um, mapping single and multi-ingredient products uh, to USDA um, FTC, Food Data Central, uh, items. <clears throat> that means uh, a lot of the SR legacy, uh, mapping to SR legacy and uh, their foundation food databases. And we want to clean up some plant and animal part redundancy that hasn't been completed uh, since it came into the Langwell. We want to expand the nutrition and food bioactive compound hierarchy in partnership with other uh, ontologies that are working on the same uh, task, the same need. And we've got uh, one health mission to support uh, some ontology work in animal disease surveillance, um, as well as a desire to cross-reference to FoodX2 in foods and some of the other food vocabularies. And modeling the farm to fork journey means taking that same level of bean modeling down uh, to other ontologies too. And with that, I will wrap it up and thank my um, my teammates here in Vancouver for uh, participating as well and supporting it all. Great. Thank you very much, Damien, for uh, this presentation of the food ontology. Now is Gurinder Gosal, natural language processing and cementing technology researcher at the University of British Columbia to talk about Lex Mapper tool. And good morning or good evening to all of all the audience, uh, depending upon where you are. So I'm Gurinder Gosal, uh, 
NLP, machine learning, and semantic technology researcher at University of British Columbia. Um, I will be presenting uh, Lex Mapper uh, tools, Lex mining tool, which we built around food and technology, uh, so ontology. So Lex Mapper uh, is an open source rule based text mining entity linking uh, tool, which, which is focusing specifically on short of phrases which are presented in the free text. So uh, before I go deep into LexMapper, uh, how it is built around and how it functions, please allow me to uh, give me a little background about how the LexMapper came into existence. So uh, we we already had the Udon and JanAPO, that these two ontologies, uh, which were built by our group. Uh, serving the food domain and the genomic epidemiology domain. So there were many prospective users of these ontologies. So they were asking for certain tools so they can make best of these ontologies. Uh, one of those prospective users was the US FDA genome tracker. They wanted to use our ontology uh, for standardizing the source descriptions of biosample, food biosamples. Uh, they wanted to do that for categorizing the foods while doing their disease outbreak investigations and uh, doing other uh, transmission, looking at the other transmission dynamics uh, during these investigations they do uh, around the foodborne uh, disease uh, outbreaks which are there. So uh, they wanted uh, some kind of a tool which, which, which can help them to uh, use these ontologies very well. So uh, we, we give, they've given us the data like uh, what, what they had. So looking at the data, we, we started to look at, look at the different tools which were already available in the public domain. So we tried to use them, uh, those tools uh, for using these ontologies or so standardizing their, their data to these ontologies. But we found that those tools are, were, were not working well uh, given the type of data which we had. So this was inconsistent data, loosely formed data, so it's having so many other issues involved in, in the data. So that was not that clean data. So uh, those tools actually work well when uh, you have a well-formed grammatical text or you have, even in the case of short phrases, when you have uh, well-structured phrases. So we decided to build our own tool. That's how the LexMapper came into existence. So LexMapper now is not only performing the entity linking, it's also actually uh, doing the, uh, performing the ontology driven classification given a third party classification schema. Uh, so the approach we took uh, for building uh, LexMapper, as, as, as I told you, the data was such kind like it was having very specific issues, unique issues uh, related to it, uh, the bio, food biosample metadata, which were given by the genome tracker. And it was having a very focused semantic domain. So ob our observation was that a rule-based approach with well-designed rules and having a wide range of uh, these lexical resources, that should work well. And eventually it proved, uh, we proved right uh, when we uh, made this LexMapper tool. Uh, and uh, LexMapper uh, uses uh, different manually developed rules. We trained our uh, system on 3,000 unique samples from the uh, biosample met metadata, which were which were covering wide range of issues, uh, which which I will talk about uh, later on in, uh, during the course of my presentation. And uh, we also using a number of locally created. Uh, look up tables to accompany with the, these rules uh, to make this task of entity linking to the uh, ontologies. So if we talk about the resources which are incorporated in the building of LexMapper, so the ontologies, uh, two key underlying ontologies which serve the domain well, the specimen domain well, those are Pudon and Janapio. And of course, this these ontologies also contain um, Diff important subset of terms which are very relevant to the specimen domain from other ontologies such as ANVO, Uberon, unit ontology, and minor contribution from other ontologies as well. Uh, 
And we also uh, created the lookup tables, uh, which were very domain specific to food bi biosamples. Uh, so for abbreviation and acronym normalization, we found that there were many, uh, it's, it's full laden with the different kind of abbreviations, acronyms, uh, which are formed uh, very loosely. So we had the ablex lookup table, and there was a lot of uses of the non-English food terms uh, in the text. So we, we made this Nef Neflex, uh, another lookup table. Uh, there are a lot of issues uh, around the spellings uh, of the food terms, and there were mistakes in the spelling. So spelling correction uh, lookup table we built around that is Scorelex. And uh, the additional synonyms, why I'm saying the additional synonyms here, because we rely on the synonyms which are there in the, in the ontologies. So uh, that's the first uh, resource we look for, but there are the cases means all the ontology may not be, might not be containing all the synonyms which you find in the mention in the text. So we built a additional lookup table called Synlex. Eventually we want all the synonyms in the Synlex to <coughs> move to the uh, ontologies. So that's how we present the ontology curators with these kind of synonyms and they continue, continually create, create these synonyms into their ontologies. So uh, if you want to have a very simplistic view of uh, where the Lex mapper is, this tool is all about, so we have to look at this high level architecture. Uh, basically two components you can see there is mapping pipeline and the classification pipeline. And the, these, these are the two key components which perform the entity linking and the classification task here. So if when the short biomedical text, which, which in our case was the food biosample phrases, which are input to the mapping pipeline, so uh, we perform in the pre-processing phase as the every other natural language processing pipeline or text mining pipeline has uh, certain tasks which are like cleaning the data uh, for the punctuations, uh, doing the uh, dealing with the plurals, and also uh, uh, removing the empty biosamples. Those are so uh, all these kind of pre-processing goes into before uh, it is further put into the, uh, the normalization phase. So in the normalization phase, we take the help of the various lookup tables uh, for abbreviations, for non-English food names, and for the synonyms, for spelling corrections, to normalize the uh, phrases further uh, so that uh, we, we can increase the recall uh, of the mapping. Here in the pre-processing, of course, it increases the accuracy of the mapping and in the normalization phase, it, it, it boosts the recall of the mapping. So pre-processed and the normalized phrase, phrases, they are itself in a very useful output. Uh, you can say that those are the clean phrases uh, from this messy data, inconsistent data. So as the user wanted uh, uh, from us, we, we also output these as a, pre-processed or normalized phrases. Uh, for example, frozen with abbreviation cooked shrimp is now frozen cooked shrimp as, as a normalized uh, phrase. So uh, these are output as the clean phrases, which can be useful for many useful tasks uh, from the user end. Uh, but apart from uh, doing this cleaning, uh, next, these clean phrases are uh, applied with successive uh, mapping rules based on the light natural language processing, regular expression, and other lexical, uh, lexical syntactic uh, structure kind of rules. Uh, so this term mapping phase uh, converts these uh, clean phrases, uh, the, the, those phrases are mapped to the relevant ontology terms. So here you can see the frozen cooked shrimp is mapped to shrimp cooked frozen from the food on with this ontology ID. Uh, so uh, this, this this output of the tax entities being mapped to the standard ontology term is, is a very useful output and can be the basis of many ontology-driven applications or ontology-driven tasks. So one task which we are doing is that doing the classification uh, for the, uh, based on a third-party classification schema, which we are calling uh, third party because third party can provide their own classification schemas and we we 
we can uh, we can design the ontology buckets which are corresponding to their third party classification schema and that and th those ontology buckets can be used to do the ontology driven classification and uh, uh, this ontology driven classification that has to be further defined depending on the type of uh, uh, requirement from the, th the third party is there so take this example here so this frozen p and carrot for example is, is mapped to these classes root underground roots and seeded vegetable resumes but uh, this multi ingredient classification or category is assigned after uh, uh, applying certain classification refinement rules uh, because that is how uh, the user wanted that if there is more than one food ingredient it should be a multi ingredient so that's where these classification rules from third party come into the picture and uh, before we look at the mapping results uh, uh, we have to understand uh, what type of or kinds of matches that can be there uh, if we think about the text being mapped to the ontology so we found that there are three types of matches full term match the component match and the, and, and we, there is a no match kind of scenario so in the in the full term match uh, when there is from uh, the specimen description maps to one ontology term uh, whether it's, it's through the direct map, mapping or it's by the application or certain or rules or certain treatments which are done on that. So you can see the chicken breast and sleep cook frozen are mapped to one ontology terms. Uh, and this is called the full term match. In the component matches, there can be the cases when not all the text entities map to one ontology uh, terms. Actually, they are mapping to different ontology terms. So in that case, uh, you, you could see that those are the component matches. But the cases can be there when the, all the key underlying uh, tokens or concepts in that input description maps to uh, the different ontology terms. And uh, those are also semantically correct. So we can say that these are the full term equivalent kind of component matches. So we are covering actually all the key aspects of the input description. But there can be the cases when there is component matches, they are just uh, capturing one key component and uh, those kind of matches are the partial matches. And there can be cases when there are no matches at all because some ontology terms are missing or there is some other issues. So uh, with, on this slide, you can look at how the different treatments or application of rules comes into the picture. So here you see the uh, punctuation treatment uh, is making it possible for fish meal to map to an ontology term and on the right hand side column you are also seeing the third party classification uh, which is being done for these these specimen descriptions uh, here you can see the change of cases they are here the mentioning the text is different from the terms in the ontology of course the synonym normalization will come into the picture here you can see the plurals uh, spelling correction in the in the case of the macter or homo sapiens uh, that is uh, coming into the picture and here mix is being uh, normalized to mixture and FRJ is being normalized to frozen to make the uh, mapping possible. And uh, this is uh, another slide represent presenting those cells basically. So you, you can see here the arbitrary ordering in the input is, is being captured and arbitrary ordering in the also in the, on the resource side, I mean the ontology side is being captured to make it possible, the, the map make, mapping possible of <coughs> the text to the ontology term. And here you see the non-English uh, substitution, language substitution is being done to make this, uh, these specimen description to map to the ontology terms. Actually, we observed that this is not only a single treatment or a single rule which goes into uh, uh, make, uh, making the map, mapping possible. It is actually the uh, multiple treatments and multiple rules that have to be applied for making possible a single say, specimen description to map to the ontology terms. So that is where all these different rules are coming into the picture. <clears throat> so lex mapper availability. So we we have made the source code freely available at the GitHub. So you. Can visit this github website and you can find there there is a very uh, 
good uh, tutorial also slides are also there uh, on, on github website which which are for users which have no experience as well as for the expert users so you can go through and uh, to make uh, life more easy for you can say non-expert users we also uh, made a basic very basic kind of django based uh, graphical user interface uh, providing the LexMapper to them. We, we are uh, actually enhancing that uh, interface uh, like uh, the gene interface which uh, uh, Damien has shown earlier. So we will be doing that in the future. And uh, I will be giving a demo basically on on a small test data set which I used in the, in the sample uh, uh, test uh, slides uh, used in in this presentation so the, the same test data set to be used there and uh, before that uh, there one question which come to most you know, mind of the most of the audience is whether LexMap is scalable because we built it around the food on ontology and uh, food by samples uh, uh, metadata yes my answer is yes you, there is a tutorial you can see how you can use your own specific ontologies and your own input uh, data set uh, for mapping your text to the ontology terms. And uh, only caveat is that the lookup tables which we used, which, are, which, which can improve the recall and accuracy, uh, those were very domain specific. So you either you have to replace that or you have to augment them with the, uh, your data or ent entries and uh, in those lookup tables to make it more useful. So that is my answer for that. So let us do a brief demo. Yeah, so this is uh, the website, the graphical, basic graphical user interface which we provided for the LexMapper. So that's a simple, like you you have to, uh, there, is, there, there are guidelines how you can present your input data. And, already have that in CSV file. So I will input that demo CSV and submit. And your results will be available. Yeah, so you can see the same data set uh, of examples which I showed in the slides. Fish meal in this kind of things. So mix has been spice mixture into that. And you can download your results in the form of TSV. So uh, that was all which I wanted to present. And uh, my thanks to all my teammates there. Uh, Will Sire Group, uh, uh, Damien is, is leading the ontology work. And, um, I'm uh, Ivan, Dan, for Nikpa, they are now helping the Lex Mapper. So we have funding spokes for few agencies. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Elizabeth. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Gurinder, for presenting uh, the tool Lex Mapper. Now, Patrice Bush, researcher engineer in computer sciences at INRAI. We'll talk about the PO2 ontology. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to present the PO2, the Process and Observation Ontology. Um, I am with uh, INRAE, the French National Institute of Agronomy and Environment. And uh, in this uh, presentation, I have three aims. First, to uh, propose uh, a definition of, of a food concept in a process modeling way. Uh, based on uh, food on concept, uh, also to propose to integrate in an homogeneous database format uh, data sources which are heterogeneous in company in order to have an easier reuse and also to present uh, two software tools we have developed to be able to have a, uh, to, to be able to use process and ontology uh, on, uh, observation ontology easier to enter and uh, query data. Uh, here is the, the team, the development team of uh, the ontology and the tools. In four, currently we are seven. 
uh, we have pro uh, professors from AgroPyTech, which is the French French uh, uh, you know, School of Engineer in Paris for agronomy and uh, environment, and also we are engineers in uh, in in RAE from the three different places in France. Um, in my presentation, uh, there are three parts. First, I will uh, briefly make an overview of the process and observation core ontology. Before I represent uh, the two tools, PO2 Manager, which permits to edit domain ontology concepts and also to do uh, data annotation. And then I will present a Spock, which is a simple PO2 data query tool. First uh, uh, presentation of uh, PO2 core ontology. Here on this slide, uh, what you can see is uh, the global overview of, uh, of the ontology. Uh, I will go uh, more in detail on the next slides. Uh, just I want to mention here is that uh, we wanted to reuse uh, uh, already existing ontology uh, before developing PO2, before PO2 is uh, developed based on BFO as a uh, Fudan. We also reused uh, SOSA and uh, SSN for sensor observation and samples management, also QDT for uh, unit of measures and the, the time ontology. In uh, the upper left uh, part of, uh, of, of the core ontology, what you can see is uh, uh, the, that the transformation process uh, is composed of a collection of steps which are temporarily linked and uh, um, for each step there is a collection of input and uh, output uh, components if we go to the orange uh, concepts which are shown in the bottom of a, of a slide here uh, we we see that an observation is associated uh, with a transformation process or uh, with a step or with a component which is also associated to a step and uh, if we go now to uh, this uh, new slide, we can see that uh, an observation is composed of uh, numerical and or qualitative results, which are uh, themselves associated with uh, some characteristics. And uh, um, the key idea of this uh, presentation, which will to propose uh, to use PO2 core ontology uh, to define a food concept, in a process modeling oriented way, reusing food on concepts and uh, if needed, other relevant ones. Before I took back the, the, the graphical representation of food on, which has been presented by Damien in his, his presentation. And I will in fact make a focus on the, the, the part which is surrounded here. It means the food transformation process before all what I will present, it can be seen as an extension of this part of the uh, food and uh, ontology. First, if we want to describe the process uh, in order to obtain a food, you will have first to, de to define the uh, domain ontology concept, which will be specialization of the core concept of PO2 using the tool uh, PO2 Manager. And for that, um, in the PO2 Manager, we developed uh, an interface uh, where you, when you want, for instance, to uh, retrieve concepts uh, about sausage, uh, you have a possibility to to, um, to search concepts which have already been defined in ontology published on AgroPortal. You see, for instance, uh, a collection of uh, uh, ontologies in which you have food on, but you have also other ontologies like AgroVoc or GAX, for instance, and then. Um, uh, you have a possibility to obtain, for instance, here, the list of concepts from Foodon, uh, in which you have uh, the term sausage, which is present. And here we are interested in uh, the sausage seasoning concept. And therefore, when you click on it, uh, uh, it is automatically included in the domain application part of PO2 uh, core, core component concept. Before you do that, for all the different concepts you need in order to describe uh, your own food process. And when it is done, you can switch to um, the data annotation using also a PO2 manager. And here you can see um, 
the original document which was provided by our partner, which is an um, uh, industrial partner, Solina Company, which is a French company uh, in meat product uh, in the meat product chain in France and also in foreign countries. And here, what you can see is a, a graphical representation in PowerPoint format of a sausage making uh, itinerary. I apologize, it is in French, but I will comment briefly the, the slide. On the upper part, you see in the yellow rectangle uh, the list of ingredients, which are inputs of the sausage making. And after, you have uh, the sequence of operations, of steps, which are performed, the first one being a cartridge. Uh, and you see that there are other steps in uh, blue rectangles, which is a sausage filling, a, a cooking treatment, a cooling treatment, and the packing treatment, um, which are presented here in this PowerPoint document. Uh, on the next slide, we can see uh, what is the equivalent uh, representation of uh, this itinerary using the PO2 uh, data uh, manager tool. And you can see here that uh, we have a food cartridge, uh, the food filling, the food cooking, cooling, and control atmosphere storage process. Therefore, here we used uh, the food on concepts uh, when they are available. And on the left part, uh, we can go to more detail about the different steps of uh, this itinerary. Here uh, we can see um, uh, the description of ingredients which were uh, provided by the company. Uh, it is also in French. It is uh, provided in uh, Excel format. Therefore, in the company, they manage uh, heterogeneous formats to, to manage the, the, the data. Uh, here we can see that, for instance, we have eyes, salt, we have uh, pork trimming, things like that. And we have the uh, associated massive quantity in other columns. If we switch to uh, PO2 data manager, uh, we, and if we click on the food cartridge uh, process operation, we can obtain the, the table of ingredients in which all the different uh, components are represented using uh, food on concept plus the uh, associated massive values. And now on this slide, we can see that we can also associate to steps here on the it is, uh, uh, observations. And here it is about the step uh, storage process. And uh, um, you, we associate some information about the texture of a sausage and the texture of, of a sausage. When you click on it, therefore you can go to the table when you can see three characteristics of texture, which is here uh, force at break, distance at break, and peak force, plus the uh, associated numerical values and uh, unit of measures. Therefore, when you have uh, entered uh, your data uh, using PO2 Manager, it is uh, all the, the information are stored in the uh, RGF database, and therefore it's possible to query uh, this RGF database using SPOC, uh, which means Simple PO2 Query Tool. Um, in SPOC, what we wanted to do is to create a, a web app uh, which targets um, end users who are not familiar with uh, semantic web languages like Sparkle, for instance, which permit to query RGF database. And also it's also possible to, uh, to, to have to access to an advanced mode for users who can write Sparkle queries and to enrich those, those which are generated automatically by Spark. And uh, here I will uh, illustrate Spark on, uh, on an example. Uh, we want to ask a question with uh, a numerical answer. We want to ask um, how many sausages, how many knacks have an adhesiveness value uh, which is higher than two newtons. And uh, before uh, how to do that, uh, we, we, we spoke, we have this form. In this form, you have different uh, selection criteria you can uh, use. For instance, you can specify the data set you're interested in. You can specify in the data set the transformation process. And after, you can also uh, go deeper to select only some steps and uh, only some uh, observation using adequate properties. And here, for instance, we will select the adhesiveness property and ask for uh, values of adhesiveness, which are uh, at, uh, for minimum value of two newtons. If we uh, 
uh, act click on the execute button before we will retrieve this tabular uh, uh, answer in which we can see that we have two answers to a dizziness value with a value superior to two newtons of course it's possible to export the result uh, in uh, in uh, uh, tabular format i will uh, just uh, conclude uh, this um, uh, presentation uh, saying that uh, currently we have 33 research projects uh, in our database which use uh, free domain ontologies you you saw an example about meat products but we have also um, data about dairy products and also about biorefinery uh, it's um, around 1000 itiner itineraries involving uh, around uh, three three thousand steps and um, uh, the spock uh, querying tool will be available very soon in june 2020 and the the current and uh, expected uses are firstly for uh, our uh, partners uh, which are uh, industrial company to be able to store and query in an homogeneous way uh, target itineraries for the, the, the food products they, they, they do in this, their factories and also uh, for the research and development uh, uh, labs on, on, uh, in academic or also in uh, companies the possibility uh, to study the impact of a process variable for instance um, the kind of pretreatment, uh, the input uh, component characteristics, uh, control process parameters on uh, desired uh, end product characteristics. And therefore, we can do that using different ways, for instance, computing some indicators and also to learn uh, some uh, models, for instance, probabilistic relational models to be able to make some uh, deduction or simulations. And also, uh, we, we think that PO2 can be a candidate also to modelize and to structure itineraries in primary production uh, to more easily link data from farm to fork. Thank you very much for your attention. I have finished my talk and uh, ready for questions if uh, you have any. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Patrice, for the detailed presentation of the process observation ontology and how it's uh, being used. So now we are at our question and comment session. So I can see that Robin, you have a first question for um, Damien. Question from Robin Lugy was, to what extent is food on becoming an industry standard? Right, so the extent to which it's industry, uh, industry standard. Um, Fudan has just been on the scene for three years. There are uh, other uh, vocabularies like GS1 and FoodX2 that have been around for a lot longer. So at the moment, uh, I would say GS1 is more the industry standard. So uh, I dare say it's a bit of a guerrilla a, a uh, uh, battle to, uh, to get ontologies in as in industry standards, but um, it's going to be, uh, a longer process in which um, the vocabularies become the default slowly in various areas. So uh, we're looking forward to being a part of the USDA's um, FDC Food Data Central website vocabulary um, probably in the fall and um, various other projects like this uh, ISO standard are introducing food on. There's another mix of standard for reporting um, biosamples that we'll be using food on Genepio and others so the uh, attraction of these ontologies is what will by uh, default um, move them in into play as as standard vocabularies but um, at, at the moment it's not officially sanctioned as a standard outside of Oboe Foundry's uh, collection great thank you Damien so uh, I can see that Eric and Ted has uh, another question for you. Hi. First of all, thank you for the presentations. I'm Eric and Tezana, part of Bayer Crop Science. Uh, I was wondering, uh, well, I have a technical question. It's about which tools are you using to maintain food on? Do you use Protege, Obo Edit, and if you could also comment how, in which formats you are also distributing it. I saw very quickly just after your presentation that uh, it's also it's already available in certain uh, 
websites like the ontology lookup service but yeah it would be also interesting to know how you are managing it uh, types of formats and these kind of things right so um we've taken to the obo foundry approach which supports a number of tools for maintaining larger ontologies uh, yes we use protege day-to-day um, -day to edit uh, items and um, have them in our food on edit file but that's also accompanied by a number of other um, tools for bringing in terms from other ontologies uh, so we're relying heavily on ontofox for that and um, in addition the uh, slowly we're bringing tables in tables um, like google google sheets to describe chunks of the vocabulary so we've got examples on our website right now of both wine and pasta we'd be breaking um, other uh, vocabulary chunks out that are patterned to uh, edit them and manage them in tabular format rather than in protege uh, so fish is uh, is up next for for that kind of a treatment. Uh, the ontology development kit is um, is a kit developed by some of the Obo Foundry um, engineers to help people um, organize and publish uh, releases for for their ontologies, both small and large. Thanks. And um, so, Marie Angelic has a question also for Damien. So yeah, I have a question for, for Damien. So really nice talk. So I would like to, so the, the tool that you showed, like that the visualization tool, would it be possible to use it with any ontologies or do the, or, or yeah, any file or, or is the ontology need to be published somewhere to be able to use the tool? Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, just added a feature in the fall. It's a, I would call it a modest tool at the moment, but uh, there's a feature as of the fall that lets you put in a URL that points to an ontology file. And um, it's all JavaScript, so um, you can actually download the whole mm -hmm. thing, as I recall. Um, but at any rate, you can pop a, a URL in, and if the ontology isn't too big, it will render it. Um, so any anything that has like 2,000 or 4,000 terms in renders pretty quickly. Uh, I believe it's choosing uh, uh, owl, owl thing or BFO entity as the top level. Um, it'll try to find a top level node to show everything under. And it's using okay. it, it's only using a couple of tags um, um, like RDF uh, like the IAO description and the RDFS label. It, it's relying on those kinds of things to be there. Okay, no, but I thought it was good to visualize at least, like as you said, like the big facets of of the ontology. Yeah, so, yeah uh, there's a you. list of ontologies ready to go in the pull down list there if you go visit that site too. Great, thank you, Damien. Elizabeth has one question for you as well. Um, yes, so. Um, in fact, um, I wanted to know, uh, Damien, if Houdon can uh, could link uh, the description of the crop production system because you're describing the component of a, a food product. And I think that if we think about the food supply chain, uh, we, we would like to see uh, uh, some linkage to um, how the, the, the food was produced, like was it from an organic farm? And also could link also to the trade system, like was it fair trade? So I think that nowadays consumers are very interested by this type of information. Yes. Um, so if there, if another ontology like Agro is developing um, the descriptors for that, we would be happy to um, sort of bring them in to Foodon so that they're ready uh, within the Foodon context and not just the Agro context. Foodon does have a couple of uh, descriptors right now uh, for uh, the production environment that a food is uh, created in, and um, that's the growing conditions, agricultural production environment, uh, organic production, organic growing condition, the kind of terms that we've got right now. And they're, I believe, inherited from Langual. Um, 
yes but we realized that um, other ontologies such as agro could probably could do a better job a more thorough job of describing that particular branch um, there is just a more general uh, product claim uh, that we've also got uh, for organic for example um, the organic food claim or use under dietary claim or use um, but that's more of a labeling thing um, it doesn't get into the details of, a, of, a, of being able of having the vocabulary to describe how a product, food product was created Meda I can see that you have a question for, for Damien thanks very much Damien um, I've been sort of involved in gathering content for agro right from the beginning um, and, and thanks to Marie Angelique, we have a great product now, and it's absolutely wonderful to see it visualized um, through the the Ontotrack tool. My question is this: that it's it's really great to see the visualization of the ontology, but I'm wondering, are there plans to then build out the visualization such that you can see points of connection with other ontologies? So that you know, if there's a, a one of the things you've been wondering about is pests and diseases. Um, and their control. And so if you had an ontology that dealt with pests and diseases uh, and there was a linkage point to um, agro and perhaps there's other linkage points to Kevi or other on Envo, for instance, um, you know, there then we're really building out that semantic web. So so do you have plans to, to build all of that out to enable that kind of visualization? <sighs> Uh, yeah, Ontotrek is uh, very close to my heart in that I love to visualize, to, to approach these ontologies through visualization um, because I find them kind of overwhelming otherwise. <laughs> uh, and there's a slideshow that gets into more detail about it. Um, if you'd like, I could send that to you. The um, indeed, that universe that only had agro in it, you could easily imagine ha having all sorts of other jellyfish ont ontology shaped uh, structures with lines connecting. So that Absolutely. Gets I think it would be fantastic to be able to do that. I don't know what it would take on your part, but. <laughs> right, right. Well, some more resources. That whole project was actually off the side of my table. <laughs> we didn't oh actually get any funding for that. <laughs> but. Um, uh, the idea that uh, what the next step is really to a yes show other ontologies neighboring neighborly and then b uh, superimpose queries on them to uh, draw the great the in there. I look yeah. forward to seeing that because it, you're right I mean the visualization really helps helps it you know you look at it very differently and it and it makes it somehow more tangible so that's great Yes, humans humans need geo location, uh, tangible physical location mechanisms to support our memory in order to approach information like that. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Now let's move on to the question from Oshani about LexMapper. Um, so with uh, LexMapper, I was wondering uh, with the way uh, some of the partial partial matches and such worked um it from what i know of in uh say foods that are present in food on it seems like there are a lot of uh names of foods and stuff that are very similar but have some uh very slightly different like properties added on like say onions raw or onions chopped mm -hmm. or something of that nature and so i was wondering if uh for linking if those kind of ties are handled in any way, like say if just one portion of the word matches, but there are uh, not like exact matches, or if there are multiple uh, entities within food on that kind of have the same same level of matching, if ties and those kind of situations are handled in any way. Yes, so the relations uh, between the different components. Uh, uh, Currently, are not incorporated in the Lex Mapper, but uh, that is the thing which we look at, we want to do in the future. Like, uh, if there are various components have been mapped, uh, so is there any relationship between those components and how this can be uh, <clears throat> represented in a, in a, a better format by just instead of just uh, pointing to the different ontology terms which they are being mapped to? So that's of course that's the work. Uh, we would like to do in the future also. And there are many other future plans 
also just uh, going beyond from the simple mapping to the ontology terms to to uh, include or to be more inclusive of the semantics, the different semantics uh, which are there in the ontology to be captured in the captured in the results uh, mapping results also. That is not right there, but we will like to do in the future. That's in the future plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Elizabeth has also a question for you, Gurinder. You so is there any manual validation step of the results of your uh, next matter? Thank you. Yes, actually the validation was done in two phases uh, for the next matter. In the first phase, actually the valuation was more of a kind of a, a refinement evaluation or in refining the tool or enhancing the tool. Uh, so that evaluation was based on finding errors which uh, the uh, LexMapper was committing for the other things, uh, other issues with the LexMapper results. So that evaluation, based on that evaluation, we we actually uh, iteratively had the uh, new versions of the LexMapper and eventually when the LexMapper was in its final version, then we had the evaluation for, of the results. So this was done by six uh, expert annotators for more than 1500 samples. So they, they evaluated on different types of matches, whether those were uh, semantically correct or whether they, what means we, we also defined the different types of errors which can be there in the results. So they evaluated uh, based on that. Those were they, they were given the annotation guidelines to have a consistency among the evaluation. So that evaluation is uh, uh, the results. Uh, uh, I shared a poster in the chat. Uh, so those evaluation results are shown in that poster actually. So due to the lack of time, I didn't include that in, in my slides today. So say, short answer is yes, we, we did the evaluation. We do the validation. Okay, thank you, Gurinder. Great, thank you, Gurinder, for answering the question. So and now we can move to a question about the PO2. And Robin, I can see that you have a question for Petrus. You know, when I, I look at these fantastic tools, and thank you guys for wonderful presentations today, I'm really curious about the extent uh, to which food companies and industries are, are picking up on the great your work you're doing. Um, so my question was, you know, which companies or industries are using this? And you answered that at the end. So maybe I could ask a, a slightly different question. And that's, you know, what's the you know, what's the big inhibitor um, to getting companies to adopt and work with you in these tools? Oh, I think that uh, for the moment, the, 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 the restriction that uh, we, we saw is that about the, the standardized vocabulary. And uh, um, uh, when we presented to our food companies, the food on uh, vocabulary, uh, in fact, the problem was that uh, they didn't have enough uh, terms in order to describe uh, the ingredients uh, they are using. Therefore, it is, uh, uh, I think, for the moment, the, the first restriction. What is, um, um, the, how can we ex enrich uh, vocabul standardized vocabulary, which is already available with um, uh, new, uh, new concepts? Uh, for instance, uh, the different parts of, uh, of meat uh, you can have on different animals. Uh, it is not always available in uh, uh, food and vocabulary or other ontologies before it is uh, the main restriction we, 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 we could see for the moment. Thank you. So we, we are closing this webinar. Thank you, Damien, Gorinder, and Patrice for your contribution. That's much appreciated. Thank you all, and I wish you a good uh, day or evening.